Let's pray. Lord, um, the Bible tells us there are things into which angels long to look, but being disembodied spirits, they can't. We thank you that the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us, and in his humanity, in his suffering humanity, Jesus has revealed to us the inexhaustible love and wisdom of God our Father. We pray for the help of the Holy Spirit today to interpret to us things of which we think we are intimately familiar. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Last week I spoke on how Jesus was as human as each of us, with one great exception, that he never sinned. The weak and limited humanity of God, God the Son, is offensive to ordinary human reason. But there's something more offensive than this. That God would suffer and die a miserable death has been a scandal to philosophers and adherents of other faiths to this day. I mean, talk about the suffering of Christ as a prophet or as a messiah, and you will incite Jews and Muslims against you, or else they'll be converted. Even in the church, theologians have tried to limit the sufferings of Christ to his humanity alone. But Luther, who was always on the radical side, was prophetically correct to boldly declare Jesus as the crucified God. Whilst revolutionary in his own time, this perspective has become popular in many Western churches. However, you would have you'd have to search hard in our city for a congregation that lives, lives, as if suffering has become an essential part of the Lord's own sense of identity. I'm not being theoretical in saying this, for if we accepted what suffering meant for Jesus, we would already be freely living out the cost of discipleship. <coughs> which by and large, and I keep talking to pastors and leaders from all over the church, way beyond Anglicanism, everybody knows there's a crisis of discipleship and there's a crisis of discipleship because people don't understand the suffering humanity of the Son of God. Paradoxically, affluence tends to breed the protest that the pains of this world are incompatible with the existence of a loving God whilst poverty tends to breed religion. Well, our guide in Myanmar said, Buddha delivers us from our suffering. The Bible understands the profoundness of suffering in terms of how suffering tests the heart. As a righteous man afflicted with great pain, righteous and in great pain, Job found these tensions unbearable. We won't ever grow as a Christian unless you have unbearable tensions in your life. And this is what he said. What is man, he's talking to God, that you make so much of him, and that you set your heart on him, for you examine us every morning and test us every moment. And that's just true. God tests you every moment. In a pain-multiplying crisis, illness, relationship breakdown, financial stress and so on, people become less apathetic and they're either more likely to turn to God or turn away from Him. The New Testament never approaches these sorts of issues philosophically, but always in a Christ-centered way. So Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, uh, sorry, 1, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. Paul is comforted by God as he trusts in the Father who raised Jesus from the dead for it was by resurrection that the Father of all mercies comforted Jesus after the ordeal of crucifixion and death. 
In, in Christ, you never have to suffer isolated or alone. You never need to be deceived into thinking that there's something about your suffering as a weak and sinful person that God does not understand. And that is a deception. And it's a demonic one. The suffering of Jesus is much more extensive than we generally appreciate. Well, it's easy to see, you know, physically after nearly starving to death for 40 days of fasting in the wilderness. That was hard. He cried out for thirst on the cross. He knew weariness. That's John 4. And the compassion that was constantly drawn out of him by the ever presence of human suffering was tremendously draining. You know, um, for better or for worse, I'm not sure what it is. I'm, I'm quite used to talking about drained, burnt out, and talking with drained, burnt out, and exhausting ministers and counsellors. Because compassion, you know, it's just not a neutral thing. It draws something out of you. Jesus lamented with anguish over the refusal of Jerusalem to believe in him, knowing that as a consequence, men, women and children would be destroyed in the war with Rome. And if you think Syria is bad, you should go and read those stories from Josephus. There was no mercy. But Jesus' physical and emotional suffering was exceeded by his relational suffering. John tells us, the beginning of John's Gospel, he came to his own people and even they rejected him. Do you remember the story in Nazareth when they rose up, the pack of the town rose up to kill him? These were people he knew by name. Some of them were aunt, uncles and aunties. So they'd been playmates of the young Jesus. More than this, the text tells us that Jesus' mother, his brothers and sisters were with the crowd. Did they do anything? Did they try and save him? Did they interpose themselves between the mob and the Son of God? Of course not. For John tells us not even his brothers believed in him. Did they have some evidence that he might have been special? <laughs> Oh, of course they did. All sorts of evidence. And, uh, and Mark tells this story. The whole family came and tried to, literally, this is what it says, seize him, for they were saying, he is out of his mind. Now in our terms, they wanted to involuntarily commit him to Grayland Psychiatric Hospital. Well, it's there, it's in the Bible. But somehow we dial down, you know, because we think Jesus is not like us after all. Well, I wonder if you're dialing down and I'm preaching this. Some of you are, of course. Now, now all these are dreadful things, but nothing that Jesus couldn't cope with. For as he went towards the cross, he said to his disciples, You will leave me alone, yet I'm not alone, for the Father is with me. Loved by the Father, Jesus could bear any pain. But to save sinners, his death could not be that easy. Calvin was correct in interpreting the phrase in the creed, he descended into hell, of the sufferings of the cross. There in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus was challenged to the limits of his sinlessness. The text tells us he became sorrowful to the point of death. We must take this literally because his sense of the lostness of impenitent humanity under the judgment of God was near unbearable. You ever had unbearable pain? You thought it was unbearable? I remember once they did some experimental procedure into my kidney. And they said, oh, we don't need to anesthetise you. I tell you, that's my experience of torture. It just was torture. But Jesus was really tortured. Really tortured. 
Luke tells us he needed the help of an angel to strengthen him from Gethsemane to the cross. People sometimes ask, why did Jesus have to suffer so much to save us? Wasn't there a less painful way? That a natural, but uh, rather shallow question. The answer is no, he had to suffer that way. Because the scripture teaches us that the Father could only bring the Son to perfection through limitless suffering. With the most brilliant insight, Luther said, the cross puts everything to the test. I don't know any other way to teach, preach and counsel people. The cross puts everything to the test. I'll try and expound that a little bit. <clears throat> Despite all appearances, my life, your life, the quality of every human life is tested by the suffering crystallised and concentrated in the cross. The cross tests everything because, first of all, the cross tested Jesus. You know, pain always provokes a why in the human heart. But there are two sorts of why. One heads to hell and the other heads to heaven. Why me? Why is this happening to me? What have I done wrong to be suffering like this? God, why don't you get me out of this? Well, that's the normal way, normal way, to respond to God through suffering. You don't need any grace or supernatural spiritual presence to be aid like that. It just comes naturally. But that's not what Jesus was asking on the cross when he cries out in his unbearable agony, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He is asking to be able to see what he cannot see, the greatness of his Father's healing and saving purposes for humanity. He is bearing our sorrows, our griefs, our wounds, our sicknesses and our sins to save us. But under our judgment, these saving purposes must be hidden from his own heart for him to be tested in his suffering by the cross. The hiddenness of all the divine goodness brought anguish to God's Son infinitely more painful than any ordinary human suffering. In merely human terms, the cross just looks like a man dying alone and isolated in physical, emotional, relational and spiritual darkness. Remember the darkness came? But the cross is God's mysterious revelation of his purposes for creation to fill all things with the tested character of Christ crucified, the perfected image of God in humanity. You can see even now, although in part, by meditating on the tested character of Christ crucified, the future which will fill the whole universe with the glory of God. The perfection of character in the humanity of the Son of God. That's the destiny of the universe and why the cross is the revelation of the purposes of all the things of God for the future. The wisdom of God through the cross is inexpressibly wonderful. inexpressibly wonderful. If the judgment of an infinitely holy God came on us sinners, we would be annihilated. Only God as a human being could in limitless mercy bear away his own judgments and in his lordship forever take away the power of suffering and death as condemnations. <coughs> Now, people don't like to suffer and die. Well, firstly, because it doesn't feel good. 
But more than that, because they're experienced as condemnations. In Christ, there are no condemnations. The Gospel. You know, we talk about the Gospel sometimes. Right? The Gospel. The Gospel proclaims the complete triumph of Jesus over all the powers of evil and the senseless suffering they inflict. It's senseless suffering that's people's problem. Now let me illustrate this point. In the middle of the 19th century, a powerful revival broke out in Germany that saw healings, conversions, restored marriages, and a release of evangelistic zeal. This revival was provoked by something a demon unconfessedly, uncontrollably confessed as it came out of a possessed woman shrieking, Jesus is victor. Do you understand that? The demons do understand Jesus is victor over everything. And that began a, well, a fantastic revival actually. Its consequences have come down to the present day. Jesus is victor. Not despite his sufferings, but through his sufferings. Do you remember the dull, depressed disciples walking along the Emmaus Road after the crucifixion? Jesus came to them and explained he was so patient. Now he is so patient. You know, we're all that dull. We're really dull. But he's so patient. Do you believe he's patient? Anyway, Jesus came along to try and help them understand, and he said, Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Necessary. Through Jesus' obedient suffering, the Father has glorified Christ's humanity, a humanity that embraced all our struggles and triumphed over them by sheer faith in God. In God's unsurpassable wisdom, human suffering has in Christ become the means to our glorification and eternal life. In Christ, the meaning of human suffering has been transformed forever and ever. Understand this. Suffering through Christ has a completely different meaning than it ever had. Well, let me use an example to try and illustrate a confusion that cripples many Christian lives. I was talking to one of my friends recently. I've got a couple of them. <laughs> you think it's funny, do you? I've got any friends. <laughs> you can't imagine it. <laughs> uh, Grace can do that, you know. <laughs> anyway, and this is, a, I really respect this person. I do, I do respect this person. But um, she was going through a lot of grief about the state of her elderly mother. I could have, well, being me, I couldn't have, but I could have patted her on the head and told her God loves you. Instead, I reminded her of what the scripture says, that he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Surely he, he bore our griefs and carried our sorrows. Since Jesus bore our griefs on the cross and has been delivered by, from their power by the resurrection, by the resurrection comfort of his Father, he can be powerfully present in all our struggles and sorrows to comfort and console by his power. We all need to learn that our, our pains are not our personal property. Now, if you want something to repent of, listen to this section. Our pains are not our personal property. They belong not to us, but to Christ as Lord. Now, I have to go over this again and again and again in this In Christ, 
The why of suffering has been transformed into a place where the presence, the power and the purpose of God can be expressed. Never isolate Jesus from your suffering, which is to deny his love, which is greatly sinful. Even as glorified in heaven, Jesus still identifies with the sufferings of his people. And we unite our sufferings with his by faith. That's why Paul can say, listen to what he says. I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction for the sake of his body, that is the church. Nothing in this ageing, groaning creation can separate us from God's <coughs> loving presence. If, and the if is in this text that I'm reading from, if we suffer with him, in order that we may be glorified with him, with Christ. Now, people like us find this uh, message hard to handle. But here's a comment from a persecuted Christian in the Middle East, from Syria who says, through the path of suffering, Christians will continue to embrace the cross of Christ because we know that our salvation and resurrection is through the cross. For Christ has given us what over death and sin? Victory. 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 He's given us victory over death and sin through his death and glorious resurrection. Jesus didn't suffer and die so we can escape suffering and death. He shared our suffering and death so that we can share in his victory over suffering and death. Do you want to share in his victory over suffering and death? Well, that's why you were created and redeemed, if you understand it. If you don't understand it, ask someone, even me. I know it sounds a bit threatening, but... <laughs> Don't laugh. <laughs> a lot of people have found me threatening over the years, but I've changed. They tell me I've changed. I'm much more than I you know. Do you believe that? It's true. Who <laughs> did you find that? It is true. Anyway, I won't go on with stories about how my students were terrified of me and that. Let's just keep going again. I'm at the conclusion. <laughs> Suffering isn't the real human problem. Useless suffering is. Suffering without the why of the cross, answered by the glory of the resurrection. It's the sort of suffering, that sort of useless suffering, that I see in Christians who can't escape depression, who become embittered, or as I've even encountered recently, try or succeed in committing suicide. Christian people. This is sobering. Whilst the eternal purpose of suffering to make us Christ-like is hidden from unbelievers, there need not be any useless suffering amongst the people of God. In an age where people can't bear the thought of a lifestyle cramped by pain and multitudes are seeking to drown their sorrows by a host of addictive pleasures like alcohol, drugs, sex, gambling and particularly shopping. <laughs> well, it's just true. They're driven to shop. You don't shop till you drop. I shop, therefore I am. And, you know, <laughs> haven't you heard any of those this morning? Why are you laughing? These people are trapped by you know, demonic powers that infest them. I keep going. Okay. There are huge opportunities for suffering Christians, that's all of us, to put our trust in the victorious suffering humanity of Jesus so that by the power of his spirit, lost men and women might come to faith in Christ through the lens of the life of Jesus. I see sadness turning to excitement, proclaiming 
Jesus is victor. Let us pray. Well, Father, thank you that when Jesus said, uh, it's finished, finished, he didn't mean I'm finished. He meant I've done the work, I've, I've conquered it all, now take me to glory. And that's the testimony you call us to, to live that close to Jesus. Now please strengthen our faith in your word by his spirit, that there might not be any useless suffering in our lives. We pray this for Christ's sake.